This show is sponsored by the National Association for Primary Education. Hello, my name is Mark Taylor and welcome to the Education on Fire podcast. The place for creative and inspiring learning from around the world. Listen to teachers, parents and mentors share how they are supporting children to live their best authentic life and are proving to be a guiding light to us all. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. You will have heard over the last few weeks how we're re-releasing some podcasts as bonus episodes, which we've been originally under the Education on Fire podcast network umbrella. Um, But now, because we're refocusing all of this so that everything is part of Education on Fire, one place, one message of sharing creative and inspiring learning, this is, I thought, was a conversation that originally I produced for the National Association for Primary Education. But I think in these turbulent times, in the current situation we are with many of the countries in lockdown, it just gives us a point to reflect on what we think education is and how it actually fits together with so many people learning remotely and schools not looking like they've ever looked before. It really is an opportunity for us to really dive into how we think education might progress in the future. Today's episode is with Richard Gerver um, and he's written a book called Education and Manifesto for Change and it's a call to arms to inspire all those involved in education to consider how the school system can be made fit for purpose in our turbulent 21st century world. He's a renowned educationist and he argues that educators must work together to find innovative creative strategies to prepare students for their lives ahead and to teach them skills and knowledge that will be valuable far beyond formal education. Schools must collaborate with people and organisations outside their normal experiences so that they can be the catalysts of a better, more connected and more coherent future for today's children and tomorrow's adults. I think that's a really great point, bearing in mind exactly, as we said, the experiences that everyone is having here. So I hope you enjoy this. This is my conversation with Richard Gerver. Today, I'm very excited to be talking to Richard Gerver, who's a former head teacher and has a brand new book out called Education and Manifesto for Change. And having been through the book, um, I think all of us listening who are involved in NAEP um, will be thinking absolutely hallelujah and um, let's have this conversation and I'll let him explain more and more about what's in the book and, and that conversation that we're going to have. But um, thank you very much for joining me, Richard. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, Mark. Thanks for having me. So let's set the scene. Um, I've just said that you're a former head teacher and let's te- sort of wind back a little bit and just mm. sort of explain your sort of education background and then <laughs> we'll work through to how the books then then came from there. I, I often think that um, <laughs> my my professional life is a series of happy accidents. Um, I became a teacher because I started dating um, a young woman at college who I fell madly for, who was training to be a teacher. Uh, and so in order to get into her good books, um, I told her how fantastic teaching was. And she kind of called my bluff. And uh, eventually after my de- had that sense that this is where I belonged um, and why had I never thought about it before? Um, and I carried that through my career, um, which, as I say, was a seem to always be in the right place at the, or the wrong place at the right time or the right place at the <laughs> wrong time. Um, you know, during that first time, we had a government who were, how can I put this um, kindly, cost cutting. Um, and uh, a huge number of teachers were being offered early retirement, which left vacuums in the system. So I found myself in senior leadership positions very early in my career um, and actually became a head in 2001. Um, had the incredible privilege of leading a remarkable community uh, on the borders of Nottingham and Derby in a place called Long Eaton. Um, and we went on an incredible adventure together for nearly eight years, turning round a, a school um, that the then government had dis, uh, had designated in 2001 as a school so bad they were considering closing it down. Um, and the community did some extraordinary things. You know, we may we may reflect on this as as we talk later. But one of the really interesting things, of course, is when you're um, you inherit a school which has nothing to lose. Um, you have the ability to far, be far more innovative and creative um, because you have far less to to, to lose and risk. Um, and and that was an extraordinary adventure that opened all kinds of of unforeseen doors for me um, and opportunities. So that um, in the back end of, of 2008, 
um, I decided to take a personal risk, not because I had fallen out of love with teaching or was exhausted by it, but because I had an opportunity to go on a new adventure of my own. And, and that's when I left Grange and, and started a new life, um, doing all kinds of things, which over the last decade has seen me not just working in, in education around the world, but but sitting around a table in, and in buildings with, with extraordinary people and extraordinary organizations, you know, from some of the world's um, most dynamic high-tech businesses to Olympic coaches and sports teams um, across a whole range of sectors in, in a whole range of countries. And I, and I think that brings me to the book, really, because... Um, as I marked the decade of my time being away from from education um, directly, uh, I realized that over the last 10 years, there was so much that I'd seen and experienced that I remember thinking, God, I wish I'd known that when I was a teacher or I wish I'd known that when I was a head. And that really was the stimulus for the book, you know, a, a really reflective space a decade on. And I just decided that what I really wanted to do was share some of the, the experiences and thoughts I'd had over the last decade, having had this extra, extraordinary opportunity to broaden my own horizons about how I think it could impact on the education debate constructively now. And I mean, it's early days, the book's only 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 just come out, but I mean, it's got some some fantastic people who are talking so wonderfully about it um what's the f what's the feeling from the feedback that you've had already in terms of those types of things that you talk about which we'll, we'll go into in, in a second but in, sure. in terms of how change can happen um as opposed to a, a, the discussion about the fact we'd like it to be different and this is how we think it could be yeah i i think the really important thing for me is that as a profession we have a lot more opportunity than sometimes we feel we do. Um, I think so much of our lives, and particularly now, actually, um, as educators, as school leaders, we are so overburdened with so much to juggle with, whether it's horrendous stretching on resources, um, the inability to deliver for all of our kids, um, the unbelievable over-intervention from successive governments with strategies and systems. I think what, what the, the feedback I've had from the early stages of the book is both that this is empowering and optimistic, because for me, I think if we can uh, find the time and the space to remember the power of ourselves as a profession, as a collaborative, by um, finding the time and space to share our experiences with generosity and with openness, to have those constructive dialogues and discussions. I actually think we have far greater control than we think we have. And I think that if we we come back together as a profession, if we share our passions, our beliefs, our vision, our experiences, and by the way, and we'll, we'll come back to this, the enormous skill um, that teachers demonstrate, great teachers demonstrate every single hour of every single day, I think we can make a really demonstrable difference to the children in our care. Um, and, and what I hope is that this book is really an optimistic and constructive stimulus for those conversations and those collaborations. I think one of the things that strikes me from what you were talking about before as well as then is that is a little bit like when you said you were at the Grange, when you have a school which feels like it's only got one direction to go in, um, it gives you the opportunity to, to sort of stand up and say, let's try this, let's try that. And I wonder whether actually as an education system as a whole, we're getting close to that now. And actually whether from that point of view, like I say, being optimistic, but actually feeling like things have got to change. So therefore, let's really try it. And like you say, the teachers and the people working in schools are actually the, 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 the place where that's going to probably happen as a starting point. I, I think that's a, a, a I think it's a really strong observation but and, and I don't you know I'm, I'm not I'm not mentioning this for any political reason and I'm sure people may well shut off the minute I say the word but one of the things one of the lessons I think we've learned from a broader context in the current political climate around um, <coughs> brexit is that actually um, we have more control and power than 
we think. And and I think as as people lose patience um, with politicians, whatever side of any kind of argument we're on, what we realize is that there is a new um, there's a new energy towards activism. You know, whether it's the young people walking out of classrooms to campaign on climate change, whether it's the massive rise um, in homeschooling, both in the UK and the US, um, people are really beginning to take um, power over things that matter for themselves. And I think the golden, I think we're always, you know, there are always golden ages of education when I think, you know, we live through periods of darkness and there, there comes a tipping point, an upward point in the curve. And I very much detect that, that we're in that space now. Um, my daughter uh, started her teaching career uh, in September. And one of the things that she feels very strongly and she talks about a lot is that she's detecting that um, a real optimism amongst her generation of very young teachers who believe they could lead that next upward curve. Um, and so I definitely think that we have more control and power than we think we do. I think there is tremendous opportunity um, as various agencies start to open up again conversations about broader curricula. The debate is, is opening up again about forms of assessment and accountability. Um, and I think as a profession, you know, I, I was very fortunate, I think, to be um, a youngish teacher in the early to mid 90s when I think we started to see the last upward curve. And, and I think we're in that place again now. I think part of it for me as well is, is the understanding that often policy changes because they take on board what they see as a positive movement and then create it into their own idea. <laughs> um, and, and I think from that standpoint, you, we really do have a lot of influence and a, and a lot of power because actually, the, you know, the, the policies and, and the agenda comes up when it has to be addressed, you know, a little bit like um, mental health um, within schools and the idea of well-being and mindfulness being a more integral part. And I was at a conference recently where Damon Hines was talking about how this is going to be becoming more and more prevalent within schools and, and various schemes that they're, they're, they're starting to pilot. Um, but it's because it's constantly in the news now, it, you know, the data is there and, and it's a very sad state of affairs. But because it's now on the on the agenda, it's becoming part of it. And I think, like you said, as teachers, as people within education, we can actually have some kind of dialogue to start some of these ideas to make it something which they we really feel like can make a difference. And I, and I think it's very encouraging to hear, like you say, young teachers feeling like they can they can be the change and actually. Um, you know, actually sort of lead from there because you hear quite a lot about the fact that NQTs, you know, they go into the profession within five years, the, a large percentage have left and all that. So to actually, like you said, to sort of reframe it and to have an optimistic idea about it and actually to hear stories like that is, is incredibly empowering, I think. Yeah, I agree. And and by the way, I think you're right. I think it's very interesting to hear the, the tones coming from our policymakers now, um, to a, a recognition, particularly about things like um, a, a well-being, um, about equality, about um, you know, mindfulness, particularly around mental health, I think is hugely important. I think there have been some really exciting, talk about activism, I think there have been some really exciting um, pressures put to bear in recent times around um, really looking again at resourcing and teaching for children with uh, special and complex needs, for example. Um, and I do genuinely sense that we're, the pendulum is swinging a little bit back in the favor of the profession again. And by the way, I don't think we can underestimate um, the power of an organization who many people go cold at the sound of, but the, you know, the OECD, because they produce PISA reports. Um, the fact that they are now saying that their PISA tests are going to include things like problem solving, collaboration, well-being, um, start to shift government policy. Um, and of course, that comes down from the OECD being a deep research organization who spend 
a huge amount of their time talking to educators and students directly. So I do think, you know, sometimes there's a danger that, that we do get deeply frustrated that our voices don't seem to be being heard. But I, uh, over the last couple of years, I detect that our voices are more heard than we believe. Um, and I do think that, that to an extent, um, the moral power that we as educators have and the deep commitment that we have for our students are messages that are always heard. And, and I think sometimes we underestimate um, we underestimate how much respect as a profession we have amongst parents, grandparents and the wider community. You know, most years, uh, the I Ipsos Mori carry out what they call a veracity index, which is basically a poll into the most trusted professions in the country. They've been doing it now for about 15 years. And every single year of that, uh, that poll, including the last data, which was for 2018, teachers have come second only in that trust index to doctors and nurses. I think we have currently in the last, the last data suggests we have an 87% trust rating amongst uh, the public. And just to put that into some kind of bearing uh, and context for people, um, I think that journalists currently have a 17% trust weight rating and politicians are at 21%. Um, so it gives you some idea actually of, of how how much potential we have as a profession to make sure that our judgment is heard and can really make a difference. So take us through the, the, the format of the book. I mean, you, you've been talking exactly in the way that the, the, the way the book comes across, but give us the people who won't have read it yet an idea mm -hmm. of, 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 of how you formatted it in the fact that it's um, it's not so much a how-to guide as, as, a, as a, like you said, a dialogue from your experience and, and the group people you've been speaking to over the last few years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first thing to say, and one of the things I say in, in the outset of the book, you know, there are, I, I am very conscious that I haven't been a practitioner in education for over a decade, although I'm, I'm still very close to the system and, and still work in and around the system. As I've already mentioned, my daughter's a teacher, my wife's a primary head teacher. But I was very conscious of not wanting to write another preachy tome um, from somebody on high telling teachers either what they can do, could do, should do, or could can't do. Um, and actually what I wanted to do was form far more of um, a provocation for conversations and discussions, because I think that's where meaningful change comes from. So really, as I break down the book, it has 10 um, clear, distinct chapters. Each one, I hope, takes, um, if you like, uh, an area to discuss as, as a starting point for vision, for practice, for thinking. Some of it is, is um, I suppose, um, quite big picture. So, for example, in the first chapter, I try and set the tone for the book by really uh, um, pleading for a sense of peace amongst the profession, you know, by looking at the, the bigger issues, the polarized debate that we've seen in education particularly, I think, grow in the last decade where sometimes social media has been used to demonize, where we seem to have reversed back into a place where some of the dialogue and argument tends to be polarized between what some people label as progressives versus traditionalists, where we seem to have resurfaced the arguments around whether we should be teaching skills or whether we should be teaching knowledge. Um, and what I, what I really want the book to do is to ask people to lay down down arms, if you like, come back together and refocus on the one thing we all have in common, which is that we all, whatever our position, whatever our experience, whatever our belief, we all want what's best for our kids. Um, so, you know, it, it starts there. A lot of the book is really um, in, in that kind of tone around both collaboration within the profession, but also a belief that we as a profession need to broaden our horizons and ensure that the dialogues around the future needs of our children and around the future structures of education should involve everybody in our society. So, you know, taking in not just um, increasing that conversation to parents, grandparents, prospective parents, but also to businesses and organizations and sporting organizations. You know, said right at the start of our conversation 
Over the last decade, having had the incredible privilege of seeing into the workings of some very interesting spaces and places, from Google to the British Olympic team, um, is the number of times I've sat, for example, watching high-level elite sports coaching, thinking so much of what they're doing has so much resonance and relevance to us as teachers. It would be really interesting to share practice. So I've tried to highlight some of that in the book and, and ask asking people to look at what we have in common and what we can learn from each other in those elements. Um, I also try to talk a lot about our responsibility as educators to project a sense of optimism to our students, um, to our communities. Um, and also, and you know, I'm going to name drop here, Mark. Um, I also had the opportunity to interview Barack Obama during my time writing this book. It was purely, it was kismet really. But, but you know, I, I had to include some of his thoughts um, and, and his reflections on the state of education globally and its wider context in the world. And, and I suppose that's really where the frame of the book comes from. I want, to, I want us all to look up and recast where education sits in the bigger picture and particularly around our aspirations for the future and the future for our kids. I think the thing that I've found interesting in certainly in the last sort of two or three years as, as this podcast network has developed is that I've been invited to all manner of conferences, all manner of um, speeches, and you, there's a very clear divide between that kind of business element and the education element in a way that I think you're right, there's actually much more collaboration in reality. Um, mm. So many business leaders have said, these are the types of skills that we're looking for in, in, in the people coming through into into the workforce, you know, in terms of that collaboration, thought, um, working together, all of those kind of things. Um, and when you sort of think back in terms of, you know, the education system historically was created in order to build a workforce, mm. but it hasn't actually changed over the <laughs> two or three hundred years that it's been set as it is. Yeah, I, I find it really interesting that if even whether you believe it or not, whether you'd like it or not, if if one of the main drivers is to create a, a workforce for the future or to create a society for the future or create people that can be responsible and, and part of a society to take us forward, that listening to the other side of the coin, being it the, the business and the workforce as it is, they're saying that we're not actually getting what we need anyway. So I, I'm, I, I do find that very interesting point of kind of why the system hasn't changed from a, um, a political point of view or, or from a whole systematic point of view, because it's actually not what people are asking for even at the moment. <laughs> I think that's absolutely true. And by the way, just as a, as a quick insert before I kind of respond to that, I think it's really important for us, again, in this spirit of peace and, and collaboration, because one of the polarizing debates I hear crop up on a regular basis is that education shouldn't be about preparing kids to be part of the workforce or, or their working lives. It should be a joy of learning for learning's sake. And look, I don't disagree with that. But at the same time, um, as a parent, I wanted my children to go through their educational journeys, not just being inspired by the rich cultures and knowledge and experiences education could bring, but actually by helping prepare them to take on the challenges of their futures. You know, for me, education must be about helping nurture aspiration in young people and helping those ter turn those aspirations into pragmatic opportunities. So I think it's not an either or, but it, it, it's all of those things. And I think really what's important when we look at that, that divide between education and the world beyond education. I think we're all going through the same learning curve. And I think perhaps sometimes just by the nature of the world beyond education and the world of work, it's ahead on that curve because it has to be in order to survive. But, you know, when we look back over the last two or three hundred years, I think one of the things around the design of mass education was that it tried to prepare young people for lives of certainty, which is not a criticism. It's absolutely a right thing. You know, what we, what we did was we used education to filter and sort young people 
into the skills and knowledge sets and potential careers they could have. Uh, and then whatever route that was, whether it white collar, blue collar, whether it was through technical education and a technical job, whether it was through a kind of more cerebral or academic line or career or professional career, um, we tried to help young people find the right path for them. And then to lock down the certainty on that path. So in other words, so much of, of what we've designed has been about teaching kids how to get themselves a, a good job, a job for life, how to stick with that job, how to use that career to build the certainty around a home and maybe a, um, you know, a mortgage and, and a pension and all those kinds of things. And I think the big disparate thing there, of course, is that no matter how hard we try and wish life was like that again now, it isn't and it never will be. You know, the financial crisis in 2007, 2008 kind of ex exacerbated, amplified. It didn't create the fact that life now is, is all about uncertainty. So it's about people's ability to be flexible, to jump from one set of skills and knowledge to another, from one career to another, to spot opportunity, to be entrepreneurial, not in the money-making sense, but in the mindset sense, to be able to keep being curious, to to keep learning, to keep solving new problems, to be able to not just survive, but thrive in that kind of uncertainty. And to an extent, I think the problem, therefore, that we've um, experienced in education, which, by the way, has been reflected in so many of the areas in that broader context and experience of my last 10 years, whether it's been in pro sport or business or wherever it's been, we, we tend to have been stuck in the loop of believing that the answers lie in becoming more and more efficient. If you like, it's the, the kind of Taylorist um, model of industrial thinking, you know, that if you focus on efficiency, you increase productivity. If you increase productivity, you increase profitability, which you then need to invest invest in increasing the cycle of efficiency. Um, and, and when we think so much around, particularly at policy level, the education response to this increasingly uncertain world, it appears to me that at policy level and political level, we just keep being obsessed with trying to make the system more efficient. And I think the problem there is, is as the world beyond education realizes that it has to change, it has to be more uh, creative, more entrepreneurial, more diverse. We've kind of got stuck in that loop in education. And I think we now have to break out of that cycle and realize and certainly help our policymakers realize that the future of education is not to be found in making the, assist, the, the existing system more efficient, but actually finding ways to truly evolve it. And I think... I, I I really enjoyed the whole talking about community and collaboration and, and, you know, villages as opposed to silos and that kind of thing. I think it's a really important factor. Um, I'm, I wonder exactly how easy that is to change in, in the current climate because, you know, many schools, um, my daughter came out, they had uh, their primary school, she's now no, no longer there, but they had... Uh, the school was increased by sort of half as much again and with that came a big oh we're now in a prison I think was the comment she said because the fences had gone up and safeguarding was such a key yeah. factor um is you know I guess they talk about it in terms of stopping children leaving school as well in terms of people coming into school but that sense that you're in you know a place where you're locked down for the day mm. um is a very different feeling than the fact that um, there are some schools, for example, I visited recent times where they actively didn't want that to be the case. So even if they had to have the, the, the fence as a, as a physicality, they would actually be doing some of their mass work in the local shop because the local shop was allowing them to be part of what was going on for a morning and they were able to buy and sell and, and do their mass within a school um, a shop environment, which I thought was wonderful because it had that community element, it had the learning element, it had the social element. But in, in, in terms of safeguarding, in terms of... Um, checks and all of those sorts of things it's a minefield and like you say when time is is precious and, and everyone's struggling for for all of that and they need certainty as well the two things don't really go together very easily do they so I just sort of wonder about how how practically maybe some of these things need to change in in order for what we're talking about to actually take place or whether it, it's not as straightforward as that it is just a question of sort of small small elements bit by bit I, I think that's I think I think your last comment is really important, Mark, because one of the things that I've learned a lot about 
changed culture in the last few years is that it doesn't happen overnight and it doesn't happen because of a system or a policy fix. And I, and again, I think it's one of those things as, as, a, as a profession we've, we've suffered from over the last 30 or 40 years is the constant, uh, constant both intervention and belief that we need to use silver bullets and that policy and systems need to change dramatically and speedily and they need to happen, you know, by Christmas. Uh, <laughs> I, I think one of the things uh, about change is is that they always start small you know revolutions don't have never started through history uh, at 10 o'clock on a wednesday morning you know with a mass movement they start with a voice and that voice a bit like a sneeze um catches two more voices and those two voices catch four voices and i think the same is true of change process um it can begin it doesn't have to begin it shouldn't begin in grandiose statements or grandiose launches it can start in each and every teacher's classroom with five minutes of different here or five minutes of different there. It can begin by inviting a local shopkeeper in to talk to our students about retail and the and the use of maths in retail. Um, it can be, you know, it can begin by inviting um, a presenter from the local BBC radio station in to talk about the importance of literacy and of vocabulary and language. Um, it, you know, it, it can begin with inviting somebody who works in the local pharmacists in to talk about the importance of, of science and accuracy and detail. So these things don't need to be grandiose. I also believe in, in the wider context of, of what you said, you know, there's, there's no doubt that the opportunity for collaboration for one reason and another between schools and between wider organizations, I think, is is increasingly difficult. One, because there are such limited funds now in schools to provide cover and opportunities for for teachers to, to leave their setting. But I also think the restructuring of schools over the last 15 years or so hasn't necessarily helped. You know, the 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 increased number of, of multi-academy trusts, of free schools, of different structures of schools. One of the things that, that I, I feel sorry for when I talk to some heads, particularly at secondary level, is how the culture of collaboration has almost been forcibly replaced with the cultural belief that schools need to compete with each other in order to drive up standards. Um, and I think as a profession, that is one small pocket of revolution we can hold on to. We cannot let that happen if you know what I mean. We can, we can, we can force the collaborative agenda. We can fight against that kind of governmental belief that it's all about market economies and that the only way to drive standards up is to force us to compete with each other, which, by the way, has been proven in a modern economy not to work outside of education. So it amazes me that policymakers still believe that's the right route inside of education. But I think, you know, as, as I've tried to make the book come across, it starts with us as individuals and our desire to to make a difference and to be activists in in the smallest sense of the word, to to use the, the 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 power, the control, the professionalism, the experience, and the wisdom we have, even in small contexts, to cling on to the things that really matter to us. And I think may, maybe the the biggest takeaway from from all of this is is that, like you said, it's the it's the personalization of it because the five minutes that you spend on your day doing x as opposed to y has a profound effect on you and also your your the pupils within your class um and and that has a snowball effect over time like you say it doesn't happen in, immediately or, or with a silver bullet but i guess if we're all mindful of exactly how we're sharing how we're talking how we're coming across then that has a big a big impact and if we're doing those conversations in that positive way within the staff room if we're having those around the the water fountain as it were um, <laughs> then 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 i guess that, that that's a real ethos thing isn't it and i guess school leaders have a big part to pay in play in that but i think with we talked a bit before about social media but i think positive social media being involved in the fact that ideas are coming for example today whoever's listening to this it's coming through a podcast it's not come through mm -hmm. a, a cpd session or a fact that we now need to think like this it's an individual person within education or even a parent thinking actually that's the kind of life i'd like my my, my child to grow into then actually there's so many different influences now and actually you just being a small snippet of how that can be the change actually has a big impact especially in that ripple effect idea 
I think I think that's such a powerful and resonant point, particularly going back to something that you raised earlier. And I know it's something that 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 NAEP and, and Education on Fire is really passionate about, which is this whole idea of well-being. Um, and I think one of the really important things for me uh, uh, as as an educator, as, as somebody as committed to as, as the people hopefully listening and, and being involved in this are, um, is that one of the things around low level stress, it is always begins when people feel a loss of control. Um, and I think as a profession over a number of years, that's been the greatest source of angst, anxiety and stress for so many teachers um, is a perception that we've lost control. And it, it starts with frustration. Um, and I think one of the lessons I've learned um, around the whole well-being piece and, and particularly mental health and stress is even if for just a few minutes a day, we feel that we can seize back a semblance of that control, it becomes um, it becomes very constructive and positive. And, and it gives us the confidence increasingly to, 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 to take back some of that, that locus for ourselves. And I think that's a really important part of this thing about the difference between efficiency, which is always a struggle just to run to keep up, and proactivity, which is the joy really of the job of creating, of creativity, of professionalism. Um, and I think it's a lesson as teachers we need to cling on to, but it's something we need to transmit to our students and to our wider community. You know, it doesn't have to be grandiose, but five minutes every day spent on doing something you're passionate about and you feel is really constructive and develop, de developmental can be deeply, deeply rewarding for people. And it can inspire more confidence and trust both in yourselves and each other. And it does become contagious. And I think one of those things we have to fight for is time in our professional day so that we're not always feeling that lack of control, that run just to be efficient, but actually that somewhere in our day we're doing something productive, constructive and new. And I think that also feeds into the, the, the broader curriculum idea, isn't it, as well? It is, it's the fact that while the system at the moment is very much, um, certainly in primary, in terms of sort of assessment and SATs, testing and that kind of thing, there are there are many people who believe that the broader curriculum, having music, having art, having dance, um, PE being an integral part of what's going on. When when you hear people talking about the fact that we have that is our foundation, that's what we wanted to do, and actually, as a result of that, of course, everyone feels better. You know that within that grandiose idea, somewhere there's a child that thinks great because today we're doing this and or today we're doing that this i don't like so much which is a natural part of life generally um but to find out that there's something that you do love something you can get passionate about on a regular basis um it has a positive effect on everything including the assessment if it indeed if at the moment of course people still have to do that but i think then you start to see it in context that, and, and that's an important learning curve as well the fact that actually choosing how and what you want to spend your time doing despite the things that you may not like to do as much actually is, is a key educational moment as well uh, absolutely i think you know that th this is exactly the point life is not just rainbows and unicorns um a lot of life is hard and actually learning by its nature is tough and challenging because truly to learn something new you have to hit a point where you realize your own inadequacy because when you learn something new, you have to realize you don't know something, you can't do something, or you've made a mistake. And therefore, learning is a really tough discipline. Um, and so it should be. But what we need to do is, is make sure that there is real opportunity and light in that journey. And also, by the way, that that, that opportunity is diverse and, and enriching. You know, there's, there's one quote um, that I use in my book that came from um, a debate at the World Economic Forum in January 2018, where a group of very different people were brought together to talk a, an, uh, about the future of, of education. And there's a really pertinent quote about stopping this, this kind of siloing of subjects and experiences with education from somebody called Fabiola Gianetti, who is a particle physicist and happens to be the director general of CERN, you know, where the Large Hadron Collider um, 
is based. Um, and she said, you know, we need to break these cultural silos that too often people put science and the humanities or science and the arts in different silos. They're the highest expression, she says, of the curiosity and creativity of humanity. For me, she goes on to say, I was a curious child. I wanted the answer to the big questions of how the universe works. Uh, my humanities, my music studies have contributed to her life today as a scientist as much as her studies in physics, for example. Um, and I think, you know, this is a really important part of the welfare and sense of well-being and development, not just for our children, but for particularly primary teachers who choose to teach an all-encompassing curriculum, partly because it's that amalgam of experiences of skills and knowledge from a vast array of areas that create such an enrichment for us and joy um, as teachers and, and therefore as students. And I think we need to remember that there is no hierarchy of what should be important in a curriculum or, or in learning. And that actually it's the amalgam of those experiences that not only make our lives more worthwhile and enriching as teachers, but actually lead to creating more rounded and successful human beings like Fabiola. I think that's brilliant and, and I think that's very true and, and, and certainly I, I think that idea of that breadth is really important. I, I often think about my my life as it stands now you know, I have I have sort of three very distinct areas. I have a professional musician's playing career. Um, I have my teaching of music and within the, my sort of drums and percussion setup within that as well. Um, and and now I have my podcasting um, life, which is increasingly getting busier and busier. The, yeah. the, the 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 music part of my life came from the opportunities I was given at school. You know, without that, I would have never. Well, I say never, but I I find it hard to see how that would have ever, ever developed. Yeah, and by the way, um, you know, first of all, my admiration for you is remarkable. Just, I mean, talk about multitasking, <laughs> incredible skills. My God, and plus the fact I am mildly jealous, you know, because drumming is so cool. Um, but <laughs> also, you know, I think you're right, and and it comes back to what I was talking about. I mean, it's it's um. I don't like kind of terms and buzzwords, but, you know, one of the things that is very clear, for example, increasingly, and what you've described really is a portfolio career. And I think increasingly more and more of us are going to live with those portfolio lives, you know, where we deploy a whole range of skills and experiences, many born out of those, any, those early experiences at school. I remember a number of years ago, actually, for one of my previous books, interviewing my mum. Um, which was a, an extraordinary experience. And we were particularly talking about um, purpose and, and change and, and things like that. And she reminded me of something I'd long forgotten. You know, we've, we can all remember that conversation we've had with one of our parents when we were about 10, 11 years of age. And I'm not talking about the, the uh, sex ed conversation, but the one about, you know, so what are your dreams? What do you want to be when you get older? Where do you think you see yourself? And apparently I'd said to my mother when I was 12 years old, well, as long as I can spend my life writing and performing, um, I think I'll lead a a pretty happy life and I'll feel I'm I'm you know in in the right place and as as we as I interviewed her and she reminded me of that I remember looking we looked at each other and thought my god that's kind of what's happened you know whether it's been teaching whether it's been writing um, books or, or articles now whether it's you know standing on a stage and, and giving a keynote speech whether it's doing this and talking to you on a podcast so many of those early passions and experiences are now deployed in my adult life. And, you know, like you, I talk about in a number of my uh, speeches and in, in some of my writing, that teacher who inspired me when I was a nine-year-old boy, who introduced me to the whole idea of drama and performance, and how much that moment as a nine-year-old child has served to dominate so much of the things I've loved and enjoyed in in the 40 plus years since and and i think that's a really key thing to do i mean we have our, well our, our children are sort of going through gcse's and um and a levels at the moment as well and there's very much that sense of what subject am i going to take what should i do with this and when you have a diverse skill set you know if you happen to be good at the sciences and you like the arts you start to get well but if i'm going to go in this direction i'm going to have to do this or if i go in this direction i need to do that 
rather than that sense of but what do I what type of thing do I like doing and then allow those decisions to come from there um and and also the fact that what happens is i mean i never went to college to learn to be a podcaster i thought (laughs) i really like doing this where can i find out more about it and i found courses online i started to meet communities of people that were involved in it i found ways to learn about it i immersed myself in this brand new world which i love and like you said before, if, if, if it's those thoughts, if it's those skill sets of understanding that we're putting within our education system, then it doesn't matter so much what I know now, because it's about I know that if I need something new in the future, I have the skills and the understanding to go about and learn about it. And then my life will then take me in whichever direction it is, as long as I know I'm going in the direction of what I love, which is, I think, exactly what you were just talking about. It might look different from one decade to the next, but you'll still be collaborating in a way that's very supportive for you i i agree you know and i think it, it, what's really important to me and one of the great legacies that we all have to consider as educators is do we help our young people truly understand that education and learning is a lifelong pursuit um, it isn't something that's finite you know i worry sometimes that a lot of our kids and a lot of us in previous generations view education as something we needed to get through in order to get to the good stuff you know almost like a catholic version of purgatory Mm -hmm. um, that you know uh, what what do we tell our kids well once you've done your sats um that'll be it for a few years and and then you'll be in secondary edgy and when you've done your gcses it leads to the next set of exams which are a levels once you've done your a levels and you go to university it's about you know actually should education not be something and and by the way that was you know then you get to 2021 if you go to university at all and that's where education stops and i i think that the real excitement for me as i look at uh, um and meet some of the world's most successful people is that they they have a relentless curiosity you know they they they're wanting to learn deep 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 to the last breath that they they take no matter where their lives taken them no matter how successful they are no matter what they've achieved you know, for me, that definition of success is is about a relentless curiosity and desire to learn that takes us through our entire lives. And as, as educators, I think we must understand our responsibility in projecting and promoting that mindset to young people so that education doesn't just feel like a series of hurdles, so that it doesn't just feel like something that has to be done in order to unlock the the you know the, the the door to the next part of the journey that actually learning is something we need to take right the way through our lives and as, as we've already addressed given that the future is going to be all about portfolio careers you know we it's well rehearsed that our children are likely to have maybe 15 to 30 different jobs in in their lifetime then that ability to learn, unlearn and develop is going to become extraordinarily important. And by the way, that isn't just the viewpoint of me. Um, and sometimes I'm I'm accused of being some sort of soapy liberal. Um, going back to the OECD, this kind of organization that is is entrusted with the evidential side of quality of education in their 2013 um, report called the Skills Outlook, which was the first ever global research into the links between education, employability and skills. One of the things they found from the 3000 plus major um, organizations they talked to was one of the key characteristics they were looking for in future em- employees was the ability, the ability to learn, adapt and change. And I think those are the qualities we need to understand as educators. We have a high degree of responsibility for promoting. And I think there we really sort of epitomized um, the, the two sides of the coin we were talking about before. You know, we want an education system which is broad, that gives people experiences. But as educators, we have this overall umbrella of, of the sorts of skills and the sorts of ideas that we know that are going to be important. And I think it's that that collaboration again, but at different levels between pupil and, and teacher and, and teacher and leaders and those things that we have things, an overarching idea of, of what we know is important. But within that, you have the ability for the people learning to have the creativity and, and the freedom to be able to explore in a way that enables them to do it. And, and I certainly think back um to where i am now you know 
without the English and maths and the, the, the formal learning that I did as a younger person, I wouldn't be able to write the show notes. I wouldn't be able to be literate enough to talk. Um, but at the same time, having the creativity to think how I want to use those tools and those skills to form the life that I want that's the bit that enabled me to flourish in a way that I am. And I, and I guess it's instilling that is, is, is a key factor. I, absolutely. And it goes back really to, to right to, to the beginning of our conversation when I was talking about the opening chapter of my book being this plea for peace. Um, and, and we've got to move away, to me, with all due respect, from this nonsensical argument that is it skills or is it knowledge? You know, uh, uh, is it basic skills? And if it is basic skills, what are those basic skills? And, and should children be tooled up in X, Y and Z before they're allowed to experience um, A, B and C, you know? And actually we have to understand as as most good educators do that education is a holistic pursuit of course it's about literacy about numeracy about an understanding of the world in which we live the science the the humanities um it's about all of those things but you don't teach them in isolation you don't just teach um children to read before you allow them to access books um you don't you know you don't teach children to write properly before you allow them access to a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen, although you might try and get them to avoid your furniture in those early <laughs> formulative days. You know, they, they, it's about a holistic series of pursuits. And, and again, I think the thing that one of the things I'm so passionate about is to the, we have to move away from this either raw polarizing mentality that some people, most of whom, by the way, I don't believe are currently in classrooms, seem to constantly push the education debate towards um, and actually we understand and I think often um, provocatively primary educators more than most the holistic nature and power of an education that is well-rounded you know an- another interview recently I had the privilege to carry out was with a man called Barry Barish um, Barry Barish is the 2017 Nobel Prize winner for physics for his research and work into um, gravitational waves um, and I asked him about his recruitment policy when he was putting together his research team um, and he told me you know that they'd had over three and a half thousand applicants from all of whom would have been three and a half thousand of the world's most prominent scientists applying to be part of a research team that ended up being no more than 143 people um, and and so the question that really interested me was how did he differentiate And he knew what I was talking about because he said, you're right, you know, every single one of those three and a half thousand people were brilliant, brilliant academics. They were extraordinary scientists. He said, but the two characteristics that we used to to recruit and define the people we want on our team were, one, they have to be capable of asking stupid questions. Now, if you think about that alone, that is an incredibly simple, elegant statement, but an incredibly complex thing for people to be confident confident enough to demonstrate because to ask a stupid question you have to be prepared to be wrong and you have to have the confidence to be wrong in front of your peers Um, and the second and equally as resonant to, to the quote from Fabiola was he said I did not recruit anybody onto my team who didn't have arts in their background as well as sciences what I was looking for were people who were multidisciplinary I wanted people who could think and apply learning and knowledge and experience curiosity and creativity in a multitude of ways and I think yet again it's another example for me of how this polarization or belief that you teach by numbers or in some hierarchical order or that we teach some things because they're more important than others and it's only once our kids have mastered those things they should be allowed access to other things i think yet again it it lays to waste that argument for me and again i believe it's why it's in our gift as a profession to be eloquent passionate considered and professional um, about how we demonstrate that holistic commitment to the development of our young people and i think to, just to bring this full circle i've uh, the, the, it, what really struck me there was that there were a couple of things which i i think as a as a primary teacher or certainly my experience as a parent looking in um, to primary teachers is the profound effect that that 
a particular primary teacher could have on the result of that particular interview. Um, because <laughs> one, one of the things that I often concerned me as a parent was the fact that I didn't ask because I didn't want to be wrong. I, I didn't want to get it wrong, so therefore I had to sort of back off not asking that question you know whether it's a silly question or, or or a really positive question because you didn't want to sort of feel like you didn't know it and so as a primary teacher you can just open up the environment that you can ask anything you can say what you need you can you know find out what you need by just being yourself and asking a question that's something that every teacher can do in every classroom and also even if you from an arts point of view even if you haven't got the budget to have an ensemble or a concert hall you can spend as we said five minutes of every day we're going to do some kind of rhythm game we're going to listen to a piece of music or we're going to do something and 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 i think what i love about this conversation is as we bring it to an end is the fact that you can see then the direct correlation of the the difference that you can make on a daily basis within whatever system we happen to be in as that system changes to affect what needs to happen further down the line and give children the experiences that they need. And, and it can be done now in, in those ways. Yep, absolutely. You know, um, if, if we spend all of our lives looking at the obstacles and reasons why we can't do stuff, then we'll never move forward. Humanity and human development has not come from that attitude. It's come from a relentless desire that human beings have to be curious, to always look for a solution, to look for a gap, to look for a new opportunity, to look for a moment in time where they can involve question and change. And I think that to me is probably the best definition of learning I've ever heard. And it's the best definition for me of our responsibility and legacies as a teacher. I mean, I know earlier in the conversation, Mark, you know, you, you, you use the quote. And I think it's, for me, it's the final thought and plea, I suppose, which is Gandhi's statement, which was, or challenge, which was be the change. Um, and I think that goes back to something I talked about earlier too. We need our children to lead lives of optimism and possibility. They need to grow up knowing they have the power to to evolve the world as it is today. And if you think about it, you know, we're facing gargantuan, um, world-threatening challenges right now around the economy, around socio-ethnicity, um, around the ecology and the environment. And to be honest, it's not our generation now that are going to be able to find the solutions to those problems, but it's our children's generation. And therefore, if we can imbue them with nothing else, we need to imbue them with the belief that they can truly make a difference. And in order to do that, we need to believe that we can in some small way ourselves, even it is if it is for five minutes in every day of your professional life, um, even if it is one tweak to one lesson or one moment we need to believe in ourselves more so that we can ensure our children believe that they can lead really powerful positive and constructive lives in the future and that maybe has to be our legacy i think that's empowering and and, and incredibly supportive for everyone listening because the, like you say the most important thing is feeling like we can make a difference and in that environment we absolutely can so for everyone who's thinking, right, I need to go and find this book because I need to read it today, where, where can they go? Um, where can they get hold of it? And, and what's the best way of them getting in contact with you? Right. Well, there, I mean, there are, there are two clear ways to, to get hold of the book. There's uh, directly through the publisher themselves, Bloomsbury. Um, and there are always great offers and probably most accessible place to get it are through Amazon. And it's available both in paper form and also in Kindle form. And I'm hoping that if I can use my charm just a little bit in the near future, it might be available as an audio book too. But uh, keep an eye out for that. And in terms of people getting hold of me, um, the more formal way is through my website, which is simply uh, richardgerver.com, or more informally, um, it's through my Twitter feed, which is just at Richard Gerver. Um, and I try to respond and communicate with everybody uh, and anyone I can, um, because if you're going to be passionate about collaboration, then you have to live it. So I would love people to get in touch, to engage with me directly through the book, through the book, and then directly. Um, it would be great to carry on this conversation. So thank you very much, Mark. No, thank you, Richard. Uh, it's been, it's, it's everything I love about 
why I created this podcast network is that is the, is the essence that we can talk to people and, and people to feel like we are making a difference first of all and also that we can make a difference in the future and that, that coming together as a community in whichever form that looks like in order to to support each other to, to feel like we want to do tomorrow in, in a way that we want to despite whatever confines we feel that is and I think um, today has been a conversation which sort of epitomizes that in so many different ways and so thank you very much for your time and I really appreciate all the insights you've given us. It's been a real honour and, and thank you for what you're doing. I think it's incredibly important. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Education on Fire podcast. For more information of each episode and to get in touch, go to educationonfire.com. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire.